Thanks very much. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks very much, Ivan, for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, <clears throat> I'm talking about interrupting parents' involvement, and we're looking at the whole idea of equity and inclusivity uh, for parents within the education of their children, and particularly looking at how class and income level might influence what's going on. My particular uh, approach, and I'm coming to this with a critical theoretical perspective, and I'll, I'll give you a sense of where I'm at and why I say that and how that informs what I'm going to say. Critical theory and critical, critical race theory uh, also informs us about the stratification and hierarchies in which we knowingly and unknowingly participate. It requires us to examine our place in the hierarchical system and how our beliefs, understandings, relationships, and behaviors are shaped. And so we, we accept that there is a hierarchical system in, in, in our society, and therefore we need to pay attention to that. We need to pay attention to how race, class, gender, ethnicity, sexuality, all these might be shaped by the hierarchy in our society and therefore in doing so we need to pay attention to how all these intersect and in the intersection operate in terms of how people are able to participate in society and the differences in which they, they do so. We give attention to individual institutional structural existence of classes as I said earlier and of course it demands that we pay attention to our assumptions. And many of these assumptions are unexamined and sometimes they limit our ability to know, to work, to live, to understand, and to get close to the students with whom we're working. Hence, in, be, in, in working with students, and in, for me coming to understand parental participation, then we, we need to pay attention to these factors. Uh, critical race theory and community cultural wealth, uh, which, uh, which Taro Yoso provides us, uh, alerts us to parents coming to school and children coming to school with a whole number of aspirations and, uh, and a whole number of whole bunch of cultural capital aspirational capital, linguistic capital, familial capital, social capital, navigational capital, and resistance. So stu students are not coming just with the social capital, as you also suggested. But I wanted to focus in on familial capital. That is how parents have informed and educated their children, socialized their children, to navigate this, the educational system. So parents are not just simply sending the children off to school, whatever the children learn from their parents and from the communities in which they live are things that we need to take into account when we work with kids, as well as when we work with parents. So we need to grab hold of how parents that might be telling their children about schooling, the expectations that parents have of schooling, and how they expect school to respond to them. Underlying all this is what I consider is equity. We want to be equitable and provide an equitable schooling for all children. And therefore, we're going to have to deal with all parents in an equitable way. I see the difference of equity as different from equality. As, as the, the diagram there, as, as the slide is suggesting, we're talking about when we talk of equality of opportunity, we're making the assumption that we can treat all parents the same. Uh, but that's not necessarily equitable. If we're going to invite and work with all parents, we must treat them differently. We must treat them based on the social situation from which they come. We must take into consideration the social situation. And in that case, we're just being paying attention to social justice. Bringing parents into the school system means that we have to be equitable and paying attention to their differences. 
The other point that I work with is community cultural wealth. Sorry, community reference approach to education. I, I think when we think of parents and we think of students, we're thinking of the communities in which they live and how that community might inform some of the ways in which they're thinking and the expectations they might have of the education system. So we cannot work with parents and students effectively we, unless we know something about the communities. Therefore, we need to spend time learning about the communities. We have to read up about the communities. We have to pay attention to what the media say about the communities in which the students live. And sometimes what parents are doing is reacting and responding to the community. So what we see with students sometimes is how they are responding to the communities in which they live and how the community is, uh, might be a factor in their lives. So we need to, as teachers, as learners, as community people, need to engage parents in knowing a sense or having a sense of the community. And we need to integrate the knowledge that they have of the community and that we have of that community if we're going to build the relationship with parents and students. So we need to utilize the background of these parents and also pay attention to the, how they are working with. And so as we build the curriculum with students and we build the pedagogical ways in which we're going to teach students, what we in the back of our minds then is, is what we have learned from the parents, what we have learned from what parents want of the school system and want of us as we educate and interact with their children. So we work with students to build their skills, and in doing so, in building their skills, we are paying attention to parents. So parental involvement and engagement means building relationship with parents directly and through their children. It means having a sense of parents' interests and aspirations for their children, because it provides a roadmap for the learning teaching situation. And having positive relationship between, with parents can result in positive relationship with students. Because I always, I, I, I remember doing a research last year in one of the boys and one of the students felt very positive about his teacher because the teacher, because his parents had a very positive relationship with, the, with that teacher. So those are very critical for the whole learning process. And therefore, we need to build, build our ordinary life situation into an interaction, into a work with parents. I'm influenced also by uh, Lewis McCoy's ideas about parents. He says all parents want their children to succeed through education, but some parents are better able to customize their children's education to ensure that success. Disability is, in, is influenced, obviously, by class and race and other factors. And he talks about parents sometimes will come quite, in some cases, naively, and in some cases, very deliberate and knowing what they want of the school system. But sometimes teachers push parents into particular ways of interacting with the school. So he talks about the uh, consumer and beneficiary. There is a point where the teacher, the, the parents will have take a consumer approach. In that, the teacher feels that the school must customize the resources and how they work with them as parents or with their children according to what the parents want. So the children's education and social development needs must be customized to the student. And that tends to be very much part of how middle class and upper class parents might react to, to the school. That's what the findings showed. Other parents, in particularly uh, working class parents, and we could say immigrant parents and racialized parents, who might find themselves uh, that their difference is not um, re related to or dealt with effectively by school, they tend to have a beneficiary post. They feel that the school is 
a resource. They do their best with their children and they think that teachers know best and they have to just follow what the school program, program uh, uh, is and will respond to all the suggestions that teachers make because they think that they have no power to do otherwise. And in that case, then the beneficiary report is not necessarily one of the ways in which we'd want to engage parents. We would want them to feel that they can influence education and the process of education. In preparing for this, I was also looking back at uh, what the Ontario Ministry of Education has had to say about education and about parental involvement. And according to the Ministry of Education some time ago, 1994, since this has been in effect, it says a broad, uh, parental involvement is a broad term and includes such things as good parenting. And in, if there's good parenting, of course, there will be bad parenting. So good parenting means that parents help with the homework, serving on school councils and board committees, communicating and meeting with teachers and volunteering in the classroom or on school trips. But we have to pay attention to the fact that not all parents have the wherewithal to be able to do so. And, and therefore, it means that we need to challenge that. And again, Parent Voice in Education in 2005 said all forms of parent involvement have been beneficial. In every form, parent involvement in education shows that children and their parents care about what they're doing and learning and what they value as a good education. This is especially important to engage parents, however, but we're not sure that simply uh, we understand involvement in the same way sometimes as parents. So if the parents is never seen in school, never seen with their children, never communicates regularly with the teacher, does that mean that the parent is less involved? Uh, and that's not necessarily the case because we have lots of evidence to show that parents are very, very involved with their children, and sometimes they just simply are not there in school. <clears throat> Carl, okay. yes? I just wanted to pull out that one piece, which I think I must have missed at some point, the whole idea of good parenting being written into um, that whole piece around parent involvement and the subjectivity of that. So is that one of the things that you're saying we need to challenge? Oh, I, I, absolutely. And I think it's very easy for that for us to constantly think that there's good and bad uh, parenting. So, so, for example, when we think of good parenting, does that mean that the parent who's never talked to the teacher, say, for four weeks or five weeks, or might never get back to the teacher because the teacher calls her or him, does that mean that's a bad parent? We need to know the conditions under which parents might be living, you know, and uh, we can come to some of those discussions later. And I think we'll come back to that discussion. Thank you. Uh, one of the points that uh, for me is parents' expectations tend to be grounded in middle class values. That's the whole idea of when we think of good parents, that sometimes it's grounded in those values. And, and those values are what we tend to <coughs> that uh, is, is, is supreme. Working class parents experience very little a sense of power taken, uh, taken for granted by a middle class parent. And you referenced this article already, too busy for the PTA about working class parents care. And I, I remember doing, doing that research and one of the things that parents said, and I, when I talked with these kids, they were saying, listen, when I talked to my parents, they said, if everything is okay, why should I come, come to your school? And also, the, I hear ever so often kids not wanting them, especially teenagers, not wanting their parents to come to school. But at the same time, parents and the kids are very involved in unpacking what goes on in school. And if it, sometimes the students are quite understanding of why their parents are not able to come to school because, because they know that parents are working, like some of the students will tell me, my parents are working two jobs. My, uh, my parents work in Toronto while they live in the suburbs, and they understand the difference for that. Okay. Students are also telling me that their parents provide them extra lessons. And for them, the parents think that if, they, if they, the report card comes home and the report card 
Kadi say that the child is not doing well at math, parents will find a math tutor for the child. And the, the parent might never call the teacher to find out, but they, they do go on to find the math tutor because the students are saying, to me when I talk to them, they see their parents are making these sacrifices. And sometimes the sacrifice of coming to school, like taking a day off to come to school, is something that we need to respect and pay attention to. And sometimes parents cannot afford that. Mm -hmm. In a more recent study I did the other day, I, I made mention, uh, this is about six or seven months ago, I talked to some grade kindergarten, some uh, elementary, middle school, and high school students. And some of the things they told me were, uh, was, uh, one, one young man said to me, my mother is always on my case. Uh, about did you read today? What did you do? How was school? Uh, how's your relationship with the teacher, etc., etc. And the students say my mom is constantly asking about and making sure that everything in school went well. And parents insist that this student attend a school that that would ensure the success. For example, I talked with one young man who wanted to go to particular school because he was interested in what that school offered him. He would be able to play sports at their school and the, the parents, and the school was close to it, so the parents did not want him to go to that school because the parents thought that he would get caught up with his friends not, and not uh, attend to his schoolwork. And so, uh, so when I interviewed him, I asked him, so what did you talk to your what did you say to your mom when she said uh, that you, you're going to that school and you prefer to other school? She said, he said to me, oh, my mother said, I say so, so you have to go. <laughs> and, and which was some, not what he wanted, but is how parents in, in these ways are very, very involved. And to me, those are some of the involvement that we need to pay attention to and not just simply think that it's <clears throat> parents. So parents might never, parents might never be, may, may never be at the PTA meetings, or they might never be uh, going to, uh, might never be going to uh, a trip. But that's not to say that they do not really have that commitment to their children's education. And I, I want us to go into discuss. So how else are parents involved involved in their students' education? And what, how might we start thinking about how best to engage parents in the in school in the schooling process, so that they become, so that we can ensure our students become the full participate citizen in our society. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I have a follow up question, Carl. We'll do more questions later, but I wanted to check in with you because we've talked about this before. As an educator yourself, as a parent of, of your own children, um, what has been your experience of how you perceive um, the expectations or the perceptions of, of teachers um, on low-income, racialized, newcomer, working-class parents? Does that play a role in the well, absolutely. Parents, the very I'm, perception of who they are based on? You know, and, and here's where I think sometimes they they are. Uh, the where you live, you know, that 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 uh, postal code is very, very much a factor. I, I wonder sometimes, and when I, I used to, uh, when I taught undergraduate teaching candidates, I used to insist that before they go to a school, that they take a walk around the community mm -hmm. and have these informal discussions, chats with their with their, with with people whom they whom they see in that community. For, for me then, when I when I interact with teachers, I'm, I'm wondering how much do they know? Do yeah. they just simply see me as somebody or see the parent coming into the school as coming from that community but have no other complex understanding of, of, of that community beyond what the media might present, beyond what the story that they might hear from one child versus the other. Obviously, teachers cannot know all the students intimately, but you can always have a general idea of the community and that, that 
uh, that family situation, or you can have an idea of that racial group. But you need to have an opening for how might this situation be different for this child and for this parent. And not just simply say, it has to be so because they are from such and such a place or right. because I know them to be able to. So checking what we think we already know. I'm willing to be to be wrong, actually, and to be willing to be uncomfortable with having to learn in the, in the process of not knowing. Absolutely. Okay, we'll stay on because we're gonna flip to uh, another presentation and we're, we're gonna have lots more time to discuss. I think some of the things that you talked about, especially the consumer and beneficiary roles of parents to me um, is such an, um, an intuitive, not an intuitive, but a very um, assessment oriented way of understanding how parents get seen, but also how parents are often viewed and how they get nurtured into those roles, uh, which then can also either grow the gap between how that impacts their students or can um, it can actually make the gap less. So that, that was really that research found and show that P, uh, teachers pushed parents into those roles. Well, in that's their... important, yeah, yeah. So it might start with the perception of who those parents are and then they nurture them further into that role. So again, yes, yes, there yes. always is the gap um, whatever we're doing around parent involvement, uh, as long as we're not doing or saying or believing things, putting our energies in ways that actually grow the gap for those that perhaps are needing that, uh, that, that involvement more. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to start with my slides. And I wonder, is that going to show up on there as well, Katie? Okay. Yeah, they're, 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 they're right here. Yeah, the slides are, are on screen. And just a note to everyone, uh, we've had a few questions. We're going to work to make both of these uh, slide decks that are on screen today available to you all after the webinar. And this webinar is also being recorded and we will try to make the recording available to everyone as well. So, um, so those who have asked, just to let you know that that's something that we're gonna work to do. Okay, so you can see from the first slide that uh, the topic that we're sharing today there's going to be a lot of crossover, but there's also going to be some different points made, and that's why we really look forward to a fulsome discussion at the end. So first of all, let's begin with what we mean by parent engagement. And I think uh, this is something we can agree on, that it's not necessarily a uh, very clear definition. There's lots of different things that can be meant by parent engagement. Is it at home? Is it in the child's learning with the parent at home? Is it in the classroom? in activities at school. Uh, fundraisers is something uh, we see a lot more parents getting involved in, uh, willingly or not willingly today, um, at school council or elsewhere. And I believe Carl has already mentioned, any form of involvement can be, uh, can be a good thing, uh, but I think we end up weighting certain things a little bit more than other things. And this, I wanna get far ahead of myself. Did you have something to say, Carl? No, no. Okay, I thought you were going to add something. Okay, so let's begin with what we mean. And I think, oh, this one isn't, okay, that's what's going on. See, there we go. Technical difficulties abound. So where did this focus on parent engagement begin? So research uh, for some time has shown that one of the most critical factors in a child's success in their school is parent engagement in their learning. Uh, since 1994, again, as Carl pointed out, the ministry has really emphasized the importance of parent engagement for student achievement. So we're not arguing, or would I argue, that uh, parent involvement isn't important in terms of children's learning. However, the definition itself uh, of engagement, the assumptions and judgment will be, are often made about parents who, and their particular level of, or quality of parent engagement. So back to the whole term, good parenting, who decides what that is? So we tend to rely on a very middle class, upper, upper middle class white notion of what it is to be involved in your school, your child's school. Um, and attended engagement comes to mean parents attending school fundraisers, events, helping out in the classroom. So very visible aspects of engagement are easy to see um, and, and more obvious to all. So we need to begin to see parents being engaged in particular ways or we don't recognize it or value it, which can be really problematic. So what qualities as parent engagement in a child, what quality qualifies as parent engagement in a child's learning? And on what basis do we decide which parents value and which parents don't value? We know that other research tells us very clearly that all parents value uh, education 
regardless of income, regardless of race. Uh, it's not, but we use the visible, tangible, visible, tangible aspects of that to somehow determine which parents are seriously valuing education. So parents value, they aspire, of course they aspire, they know that this is something that's going to help their students and their children. So the food for thought that we wanted to give you was the idea that if parent engages in a way that isn't visible, so a parent who says, because I'm not there doesn't mean I don't care. This was actually a parent quote from one of Paul Gorski's books, Challenging um, Class-Based Assumptions. Does that mean that they aren't involved? And again, I find it very interesting and affirming that students can tell us if we ask our students, not that we would ask our students, why is your parent not attending something? But they know, they know and understand the challenges that their parents face more than anyone. Uh, also appreciate and understand that those are sacrifices that are being made, even if it isn't a visible involvement in the school. Okay. So one of the reasons that we know that stereotypes uh, become prevalent in, in, in education, but in all aspects of life, is because of the idea of the culture of poverty is and that's one area that has um, really delivered a lot of false stereotypes about people living in poverty misconceptions and assumptions based on the select information that's basically more negative stereotypes than positive and the achievement gap is somehow a failure of low-income students to exceed so it's blaming the individual it's very much the the meritocracy uh, or myth of meritocracy so when we talk about a culture of poverty, which has been disputed and disproven uh, for many, many uh, years over through different research projects, we know that that is cer just certainly not the case. There is no set of characteristics that define a particular group of people uh, in low income, and that doesn't uh, travel across uh, different groups of people who are living on low income. There's as many disparate and different types of characteristics as there is among other groups that have uh, other racial groups, other groups that share uh, a low income as, as a common denominator. So the thing about this culture of poverty and a lot of our analysis is it doesn't offer a systemic analysis of the causes and the, and the reasons why someone might be in poverty, someone might not be participating in school. Uh, so those are, you know, that's a critique because we need to always take into consideration the community, the context, and also the systemic pieces. So examples, low income parents are not visible in our schools, therefore fill in the blanks. Low-income parents don't value education. As much as we know this not to be true, some things stick and other things don't. And I think that goes to the absolute stubborn quality of some an analysis like the, the, the culture of poverty. Uh, why do we want to believe those things about people? What is in it for maintaining the status quo to believe that people actually do um, not value education or want to remain poor? And low-income parents are responsible for their children's low achievement. So again, putting the blame back on those who um, are actually experiencing oppression already. Now I got Katie doing the slides going forward for me, so that makes it a lot better. Uh, so blaming people for their economic circumstances keeps the actual circumstances um, in the dark. So we, if we blame individuals, we don't understand about the circumstances that prevent low-income people from being engaged. The, the you know, precarious work, low income, increasing numbers of people uh, living in poverty, not because they choose to, but because the alternatives just aren't there. And we fail to recognize that parents, as Carl already mentioned, hold often several jobs. And these aren't the jobs that you can call in and say, I'm taking the day off to go to a school meeting. These are jobs where if you don't make it to work, you aren't going to be paid for that day. So these aren't easy choices. Uh, these choices are actually made for a lot of our parents. Again, just another way of saying it, that discrimination can mask the truth. So long, you know, long parents with younger children uh, may not have disposable income. Childcare is a critical piece. If we're going to do events in our schools and invite parents, we need to be able to see that that happens. Uh, poverty also isolates people from uh, social support networks and other opportunities uh, that parents um, in a middle income group or upper income group naturally have available to them. But none of these demonstrate any kind of an unwillingness to be involved. These are just hardcore, concrete reasons for why people may not be as involved in a visible way. And yet the stereotypes persist. So you could just look at those. I don't have to kind of repeat them all. You've heard them. Um, they don't buy them anything for school. Uh, the kids may not even have books at home. These are generalizations and assumptions uh, based on not really understanding or knowing the common challenges that people face. 
So imagine if people, I always think about this. And so imagine if people really believe these things about you, you would probably really want to practice visibility management. Uh, we know that students do that in our schools. So we often hear uh, folks wanting to know, well, just tell me, how do I know which students need the support? How do I know which parents need extra support? Um, and then I can do that. The reality is we won't always know. And for every person we know, there's probably three or four others who are keeping that very close to their to themselves. Uh, there's a lot of shame and blame that comes along with living in poverty um, or not being involved in certain aspects of your child's life. So there's a, it, it doesn't mean that you're not involved, but it does mean that you're less inclined to want to broadcast that or make it known that you are in the, in those circumstances. But I think here, this is really going to the feeling piece and how it feels for someone to know that there's stereotypes and negative assumptions being made. Even walking through the doors of a school or any other office or building that you might be um, needing to enter, knowing that people have those preconceived notions. Uh, one of the younger students that I work with talks a lot about stereotype threat and what that meant for her even going to university as the first person in her family uh, as a low income um, family and, and feeling like even at school, even though she made it there, she was in university, uh, there was this idea that no matter where she went and when she went uh, or where she showed up, that there were people that were questioning, suspecting and, and, and kind of criticizing her for, uh, for being her. So this goes back, this is one of the most interesting pieces that I find um, that we want or maybe need to interrupt, which is the role of educators' perception of parent involvement and value of education. So some research has shown that the value or the, the, the importance of teachers perceiving, um, influencing the expectations that students have of themselves, perceiving that parents or students don't care can translate into lower academic achievement. And so that actually the perceptions themselves, and we know this from anti-oppression training, we know this from anti-bias, that, that those beliefs that we hold can shape expectations. And perhaps what's going on here a lot of the times is when, when parents are seen in a particular way um, and expectations aren't held in the same way, uh, that we're reinforcing the idea that they aren't going to produce the kinds of results and show us that they're actually involved, which has an impact on student achievement. So is it the parent involvement has the greatest impact? Or I beg the question, how much of the perception of what is happening at home or not happening at home or not happening in the school is actually having a real impact on our students? That's something we can have some control over. And that comes from Patty Norman's work. So educators who have lower have lower levels of trust in students and parents in low-income schools. This is a multi-level examination of teacher trust, and trust is very important if you're going to build relationships. So if we have situations where students are in a school where it's largely low-income and the trust levels are harder for teachers to come by based on whatever it is they've you know decided uh, parents and students are bringing, that can set up a really difficult platform for trying to build those kinds of relationships. Teachers, and this we already mentioned, teachers lower expectations for students can contribute to lower expectations of themselves. Parents being stigmatized before they even walk into the school, reinforcing the belief that they don't value education. You're expected to act in a particular way, you do those things, and then it reinforces the false misconception. And all of these different forms of um, perceptions negatively impact students achievement and also their engagement with school. So how parents are involved matters. And there's lots of different ways that we know parents can be involved. But the surprising, maybe not so surprising piece here is that really the involvement that parents have with their students outside of the school, it has the most impact, the most bang for your buck. Um, not that other things aren't important, but if you really want to drill down on what is happening for students, which means that we have to have a little bit of trust in the sense that we know uh, if we don't expect that parents aren't involved, uh, then we don't get involved to find out and get to know them ourselves. But we we know from research that this is this is probably where the most helpful and beneficial support for our students comes from. Parents just being parents, caring for their students and, and wanting them to have the best. So instead of looking outward at families or communities as reasons for low parental engagement or unsatisfactory student outcomes. Schools have the responsibility to look inward at our own assumptions and how these are lived out in practices and policies um, if we want to change the landscape. So yes, we do look outside. We need to look outside and build 
connections and partnerships and relationships with parents. But even before we can do that, the importance of acknowledging our own um, inner, um, our own practices and our, which come from our assumptions and our bias and our pre uh, preconceived ideas about parents and who they are based on race, based on income, based on um, those things that we've decided we um, have some ideas about parents without knowing them. So what can we do? And this is where we're going to kind of get into a bit of a conversation. Some of these questions aren't necessarily to be answered today, but they're food for thought and certainly things we want you to take back to your own uh, groups and, and have conversations about. So the first thing would be to just don't engage in prejudice and judgment. Uh, so it's impossible to engage. We can try to engage, but if we if we come at that with prejudice and, and bias and assumptions, that's not going to be an authentic way of engaging. And it, my, my guess is it won't work. Um, trying a new set of thoughts on recognizing for students and parents alike takes a heck of a lot of resiliency to do what a lot of other parents uh, can do quite simply because of assets and benefits and social capital that they have. So if you're raising a family on less income and you're still um, you know, doing the things that need to be done, we know that's resiliency in action. We may not see it, but we know that it's true. Um, and just be cognizant of low income families realities. Those things that do create barriers for them, language barriers, technology barriers, which I would argue are becoming bigger and bigger um, with the increase of online communication with parents, um, even pay uh, cash online. Um, those kinds of things make it necessary for parents to come forward and say, guess what? I'm, a, I'm maybe one of two or three people in your school who can't afford technology, but that's me. And that's a very difficult conversation to have. Uh, Childcare and transportation certainly limit participation if we're talking about events at the school and school hours that maybe aren't flexible for parents who work multiple shifts, uh, different shift work, that kind of thing. So it's, it starts with being aware of those things um, and, and recognizing that we don't know everything we need to know. Could I, could I uh, add to that? An, an, an important awareness is what contributes to the low income situation of parents. So uh, despite their efforts, despite their work, despite the education. For example, today's Toronto Star has an article where that shows how racialized people are making so so little compared to their to their uh, white counterparts, and especially uh, ones living in the suburbs. And it shows the difference in income compared to say 20 years ago. It, it yeah. was quite different. So we need to pay attention to not just people who are low income, but what it is that contributes to that, that situation. How is it that racism might have been contributed? Yeah. How is it that the, despite the fact that they featured one young woman, 34 years old, was two uh, uh, college diplomas, but could not get the job yeah. you know, to look after her two children. So we need to pay attention to, to those things. So it's not just simply, individuals not work, doing their part or playing their part or working hard to be able to get the job because after all they they would want the best for their children but the fact that the, the system or the structure of the institution in the, our society is going by a particular set of values and ideas that make it difficult for them to be able to get what we would expect them to have in order to get the education for the children absolutely and i think yeah, we have to make that Point, loud and clear. So poverty is racialized, it's gendered, um, and we're also living in a time when increasing income inequality is almost, uh, if it's not your reality, I hear people say all the time, I can't believe how that family is actually getting by on under $15,000 a year. So it is almost a kind of not understanding how they can do that based on that's not my reality whatsoever, but we have increasing precarious work we have a minimum wage that's stuck at far below the poverty line. Um, and as you say, um, newcomers, for example, who, have, who come with very good education, um, aren't able to get the jobs that would allow them to, to have a have a have even a moderate lifestyle because of race and, and other precluding factors, structures, inability to, our government's lack of ability to move on uh, recognizing skills of foreign workers, that kind of thing. So. You were going to say something else. Uh, importantly, though, we live in a capitalist system. Yes. And in, in, insofar that the economic arrangements in which we live, then we're going to have these kinds of uh, income yeah. disparities. And so we need to pay attention to that as yeah. one of the major, major contributors and how 
race, class, gender, ethnicity, your postal code is operating within a capitalist system to disadvantage some and advantage others. So let's do our next webinar on that, <laughs> because I think we, we don't interrogate that nearly enough and we don't, um, sometimes I feel like that conversation doesn't happen because it's perceived to be too political, but everything's political and every nothing's neutral. And I think that's a really important point. So I'm glad you kind of pushed on that piece. Um, so I, again, some of these things are really what you can do at the school level and what you can do at the board level in terms of making your environment uh, warm and welcoming because none of these relationships that we need to have so that we can know our students and our parents are going to happen unless we can do some of these first steps. But again, if we're not really thinking about the, the structural causes of why things are happening the way they are, then we will continue to put the blame on individuals. So I often say about poverty that um, if poverty is the insult or poverty is the uh, injury, classism is the insult on top of that injury, racism is the insult on top of that injury, <clears throat> so you're also being held accountable for the very structures that you're being oppressed by. Um, and on a system level, just three suggestions, but other things I'm sure people will bring up and talk about. Uh, adequate funding for our schools. So even though we're going through a particularly difficult time right now, and one would say a crisis for sure, um, let's not kid ourselves, our schools were not adequately funded even up until now. So we've seen a growing rel reliance on fundraising, for example, on fees. Um, all those things that tend to grow a further wedge um, and barrier between uh, marginalized or vulnerable parents who we claim need to be the most engaged and yet the very realities that we either are complicit in or don't challenge are the ones that create those gaps for parents. It's not parents, it's the structures that we either create or, or, or are complicit in. Um, and be aware, so policies such as fees and fundraising, I think I mentioned that already. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so what do we need to engage in parents, to engage in, with parents successfully? Knowing the capitalist structure is not is not built to give everyone um, a fair shake. Knowing that we need to be equitable and recognize where everyone's coming from. Um, what are some of those things? Uh, and this is for you, Carl, and for others that are on the call. So what might be missing? And are there others we can work with? Uh, we, we know teachers are very busy. We know schools are incredibly uh, overtaxed in terms of, of the, the weight of the work and, and engagement is another uh, job on top of that or it should be a job that's embedded in the work that we do. So are there other people that we can work with in your opinion uh, that can support this type of um, engagement and successfully working with students? Um, and does there need to be more of an emphasis in teacher preparation on parent involvement? What do we feel is happening at the current moment um, so that when young educators enter into their roles that they have they have what they need to be able to start to understand or start to address some of this in a proactive way and is, and not result not rely on their own assumptions and stereotypes but uh, in teacher preparation I, I I like the question however I think when people are going through a teacher the teacher education program they have lots of ideas and I'm quite sure they come with lots of things that they know should be done and how it should be done because they're listening as we do the necessary critique and discussion of the, yeah. the lack of parental involvement. However, remember they're junior teachers and when they go to a school, uh, they go to a school that's already having its culture established and either they either they fit in or be somebody who's going to be working outside of the culture and therefore how long will they last? last in that and then afterwards when we think out then then they have their other responsibility their own household responsibility and you don't want to be out of a job so we have to constantly think about it's kind of be just the new teacher or, and we can do the, what we can that is the teacher in teacher preparation but it's going to have to take a whole school approach uh, and not just one teacher doing their best to uh, to work with te with parents or with students. It's going to take a whole school approach, meaning administrators have to be involved in this, parents, but also it will have to become a full board, board approach as well. Because, yes. because if these structures are, are not in line with each other, then we're not going to be able to move further beyond what we see, because it will come, constantly fall back into that which we are accustomed. 
And there was a time when community-based organizations, um, and still there are community-based organizations that are involved in um, working with schools to do parent engagement. Have you had experiences of some of those situations where you've seen some real success? Uh, yes, there are community uh, community organizations that have done so. And one organization that I think of is Success Beyond Limit. What's interesting about that organization, it's literally inside of school and not outside yeah. in the community. It's, 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 I, it would think of a, a community within the school. Now, it would mean that all, all our members of that school will have to agree and appreciate the fact that they will be doing things that the school is not doing or not able to do, or they can have those relationships with the community that the school will, can benefit from. Mm -hmm. So school building partnership with community with community organization is a way to go, but we're going to have to pay attention to how best to do it. Mm -hmm. There's a, actually a really good article, uh, and it's listed on the monograph that I provided called Beyond the Bake Sale. And it does talk about research that shows how beneficial that community-based involvement can be, um, even from a power imbalance piece, because it can be parents recognize very easily how they are not empowered um, in relation to educators and administration. And that doesn't mean that people are necessarily doing anything wrong. It's the way it works. It's the way it is. Um, and so having someone who's as working as your ally can be such a beneficial support to parents who want to build those relationships and have um, not just wait for the invitation from the school, but to be able to actually um, initiate and take advantage and, and be involved in, in ways that the sport allows for. So, and and if, uh, if schools see themselves as working in partnership with community and community involves parents, then and partnership means really partnership, not just simply the school taking the power relationship and therefore the decision without in consultation with community, then it, uh, that's what partnership would mean. And allyship, while we can think of allies, allyship also means being paying attention to what you need to know, what you need to learn in order to and not come in that I know because I'm educated, I'm from the school board, I'm from the school. Allyship would mean that you're going to have to learn from the, the other person as well. And so it must mean that kind of a serious good interaction between yourself, namely the school, and the community organizations with which they partner. So given that there is a lot of work to be done and a lot of learning and a lot of initiative to be taken, <clears throat> My provocative question is this, if we aren't prepared, if we aren't doing it in those types of ways, if we're trying to engage parents without doing the critical work of understanding that we come with assumptions and biases, are we actually doing more harm than good when we put expectations on parents to be involved uh, when we don't understand the reasons why they may not be? If we haven't done that work ourselves, are we setting up fit parents for failure uh, by expecting them to do something and then blaming them when they aren't responding the way we expect them to. And I could insert into that the, the idea that sometimes we expect or we think that parents should tell us or we should parents should teach us. Uh, and so often uh, we have teachers inviting parents into school and sometimes parents not coming. But sometimes I wonder if even that invitation for parents to tell us or to invite parents into school. Is the school ready for parents to come in? You know, you can say, are, you, are they coming into the existing school, existing school structure, but maintaining the values? You just want them to come, just have their bodies there, but don't ever do anything to change the culture of the school because it's going fine as it is. So mm -hmm. you have to start thinking, what is that, you know, what is that school, what is the culture, what are the value system into which we are expecting parents to to contribute. Unless that we're willing to change that, yeah. then it might not work. We have to start thinking about that work that we have to do on our part, and not necessarily, and sometimes have to do on our own. Asking the, the difficult question and going out to find the answers, not expecting parents to, or even the students or children to teach us, because sometimes it might not be the best thing for yeah. our education. Okay, next slide. I think we're 
So here's a provocative statement, an article that came out in the New York Times not long ago, uh, writing about educational policy in Britain that, that says that political preoccupation with parent involvement is actually a neoliberal trend, that seeming empowerment of parents in their children's learning is actually um, putting more pressure on parents, perhaps even you could say putting pressure on teachers with performance becoming, uh, especially in the US and elsewhere and maybe here, not too long from now. So if we're putting all the expectations on parents to be involved and teachers to perform, are we maybe taking away the emphasis from the system that may, may be what is not working as well as it could? What, I, what is your response to that statement, Carl? I, I said earlier that that we live in a capitalist system, and increasingly we, the showing up and enabling that is the neoliberal neoliberal expectations, the neoliberal ideas that exist. The idea of democracy, the idea of merit, the idea of individual responsibility, etc. And the more we move, we embrace some of those neoliberal expectations, the more that we're going to put pressure on parents to think that's your responsibility to do. Not thinking of how the structure uh, makes it difficult for them to be able to uh, to do what we're expecting them. So we need to see how these neoliberal notions of democracy, uh, merit, personal responsibility, and also operate in detriment to the parents and to the children, and even for ourselves as we try to use them in, to to go further. Okay. <clears throat> Next slide. I think the next slide is similar to that. Again, <clears throat> you hit it right out of the park at the beginning with the whole looking at good parenting. So the implied message being that parents who are involved are good and parents who aren't involved or aren't doing those things that we want them to be doing are bad parents. So Ray says or suggests that the focus on parent involvement can actually increase the stress levels and anxieties of parents and do parents, especially parents who are already suffering inequalities of gender, race, and class, do parents really need that kind of pressure? Earlier you talked about uh, the stereotype threat. Yes. Uh, and the, that coming up from Sears and, and, and his co-writer. And, and he was referring to African Americans and how that operates when, when they are they work hard because they know the stereotypes that exist about them. Okay. And therefore, to avoid that, that stereotype existing, and because of that threat, they work hard to be able to counter those stereotypes. So I, I think of it, I, I think of replying here, I might be seen as a bad parent. So I work hard, really hard, yeah. not to be a bad parent. So, so when the teacher expects me to show up, I will work hard to show up. And, but, Work might make it difficult for me to do so. Uh, the distance from school, the hours that uh, that I'm expected to see the teacher, all those guys. And so we have to think of some of the psychological costs to some of these expectations based on that whole idea that parents do not wish to be seen as bad parents, but, but structures, institutions, um, might mitigate against them doing so. Okay, so we're just going to our next slide, which we have, we're still waiting. Um, we have a couple questions that have come in and we actually have a question as whether or not we can share our slide decks with people. So we'll talk about that following the, following the uh, presentation. So this kind of goes to the whole conversation back to the last two slides talking about parent involvement and questioning some of these things I know has landed me in hot water sometimes it can be kind of provocative and controversial to suggest that maybe there maybe it isn't all that or not maybe it isn't all that but maybe there are parts of it we really need to interrogate and explore um, so what do you think is going on when it's even difficult to have those conversations um, that people think it's problematic to even uh, interrupt or talk about this sometimes so the question, the question is, if uh, when we think of parental involvement, is it really grounded in middle class privilege? Of course it is. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, there's enough literature to say how school very much 
is rooted in some middle class ideas, middle class norms, values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the the things by which we operate. And therefore, when we're going to the expectations we have of parents is going to be informed by those middle class norms and values. And and of course, and, and the one hand, you know, we want that that uh, parents to maintain those values to adhere to children to school and what we expect of them. On the other hand, sometimes we like the idea that parents are not too 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 uh, regular coming into the school and seeing what I'm doing, or or even calling regularly to find out. You know, so we can't have it both ways. So we're going to have to develop some relationships, some understanding of what education is, and how we're going to work with students in order to, in order to and work with parents in order to be able to advance education in a way that parents can be comfortable that their children are getting the best education that they, they, they can get and not see that we, the education is uh, is being detrimental to them. I have to say, I have to also say, there's another thing about ed education. Well, because some, when students come to school, parents are sending children, the children into class into, with teachers to learn things. And that might also be contradictory to what parents expect the learning should be. Mm -hmm. uh, parents might, uh, be, especially for some parents, working class parents, for example, or, uh, or immigrant parents or religious minority parents, parents might have certain expectations that, that they would learn, but teachers therefore might be caught in this, in this, in this, uh, in this situation where do you teach learning that, that you know would contradict what parents, but of course, it's important for the child to know. Or do you leave it be because you think you, you don't want to uh, contradict or go against parents? That for me means that the more that we can enter into relationship with parents, the more we can do a better job and get parents on board because that discussion about learning and what is to be learned and what is to be known and how what's known might be to the benefit of the children will be to the advantage of all of us and make teaching and the teacher-student relationship much, much, much more easy. Mm -hmm. So what, we have a couple of questions that are coming in. Um, what are the steps to be taken to broader, broaden understanding, engage in authentic parent engagement practices? And I think part of this question is also getting at the fact that <clears throat> schools will say they're stretched, classroom teachers will say they're stretched. So what are the steps that we can take? And maybe it starts with boards making, like you said, this isn't just a, a one teacher orientation or one, it, it's gotta be built into the culture of the school. It's gotta be a priority of, of a board of education to do this. So even under these very difficult, challenging times where people are wondering what's gonna be pulled out underneath of them tomorrow, um, what would you say would be some of the steps that we can take to at least continue the commitment or and broaden it? Well, one of the things I think that's very critical is building relationship. I, I think teaching, learning is about relationship. Yeah. It teaches, some students really learn more because they love their teacher. They think their teacher cares about them and therefore that relationship is, is enhanced and the learning is enhanced. And if the teacher and the parents have a good relationship, some the students will also feel that they're, they're, they're doing well. And sometimes students do things for their teacher. They do things to please their teacher. Because again, I don't want to let my teacher down just as they don't want to let their parents down. So those relationships are so critical to that whole teaching learning process. And if we come to learning and teaching in that, with that as a basis, then, then we, are, we, are, we are on our way. But it's not easy to build those relationships uh, because, and it's not easy to maintain those relationships because sometimes you're gonna to have to do things that the student might not necessarily like or not the parents might not necessarily like. 
But you know, because you're doing some of these things, building on the relationship that you have before, it might be easier than building on something that you that that might be contentious from from me. So I think one of the things we should do then is see about how best to build those relationships. How best we talked about partnership earlier. How best to construct those partnerships with communities and with with parents, and also how best to be able to address some of the and support some of what the children and parents might need coming from you as a teacher or from you as a school. All, all these as and sometimes I don't know if we can ever get authentic. You know the idea that things are really authentic. I'm not sure if we can ever get there. But if that's an aspiration, that so be it. Right. But if we always think that things are never achieved fully, just as the questions might never be answered fully, but our uh, might be uh, might bring further and more questions. If we can think that some of these uh, aspirations, therefore we work towards aspirations, then rather than thinking that we have accomplished the goal. And education should always be, and working with parents and working with students should always be an aspirational thing so that we can always think what better can we do? What right. else can we do in order to make these uh, uh, things accomplished? So in looking at some of the research, one of the one of the things that has been talked about a fair bit is, is home visiting, um, going to parents, uh, reaching out to them where they are and finding out what they need. Uh, that might not be the easiest thing for us to figure out how we could do here. Uh, I do know that I worked for a provincial project in the 90s, Better Beginnings, Better Futures. And so as well as being a community development project, uh, we had folks who were additional supports in the classroom and also visited families in the home. So they became kind of that liaison between schools and, and homes. Um, it was very new idea at the time, but as time went on, uh, teachers started to see how that was helping build their relationships because parents weren't starting out from a very vulnerable position, reaching directly out to the school. They were going through a bit, uh, someone who, was, who spoke their language, who um, understood some of their concerns and some of their vulnerability. And that was very, very proactive and very, very um, successful, I, I think. We, we actually replicated it because we felt it was so successful. Those are things that do cost money. Those are initiatives that could actually really, for the small amount of money that it costs, have a huge impact in the long run. Um, and then juxtapose that against the money uh, that we the schools receive through parent reaching out grants, um, which has a lot of caveats and parameters on it. It can only be spent on certain things. It certainly can't be spent on something like a family visitor to do work in the community. Um, it, so it usually ends up leaning itself more. I'm not saying it's a problem, but it can lean it, lend itself to just one-off events um, where we think parents come out and then we've done something and they've become engaged when really they've attended an event. Uh, so again, throughout the literature, events aren't really truly parent engagement. There are times when parents come to schools um, it's what happens at those opportunities that will either engage or not engage parents. What is your thoughts on how money that the ministry recognizes as important to support parent engagement um, could better help us achieve that uh, than certainly just events that parents come out to once? I'm intrigued with the idea of, of vis home visits. I'm going, you know, I, I one of the things I think here is that I, is the the insurance yes. uh, cost and mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that uh, p uh, parents might not necessarily or the boards now are not able to do those kinds of things right. because of all, all these other things uh, the implications of that but it would be nevertheless useful and there are some teachers who who do that and build relationships with that and and. So those kind of things. But I was thinking about as well when you talk about the events. I think of these multicultural events as one way in which we get immigrant parents, uh, racialized parents, or to come to school, which I, I wonder how helpful they are. Because 
I, I think where teachers uh, think about if we can just show their culture or bring parents in to talk about their culture, then we will be getting hold of them. But we have to see culture as constantly changing, not the static thing. And also, kids who might be born here, second generation or third generation, might not necessarily connect with the culture in the same way. Or they don't want it in school because... Or, or, or. So, again, when we talk about relationship and getting to know, and really questioning things that we do, it all comes back to how much we're going to just simply not assume that these things that we have always done. And it is true that last year a, a good teacher might have done a particular program, bringing parents in school, inviting the child's uh, parent on field trip, and, and or inviting them to have showcase their culture, quote unquote, which I never think is, to, is totally the best way. It might have been done last year, but this year you might try to do it, but it's not, it might fail because of the very thing that we're having different groups of students. And that's the other thing about, about teaching, is that every year you cannot predict the kinds of students you're going to have. What worked last year might not work this year, and might not work the year after. So teachers have to constantly be revisiting the program. Of, and that's why sometimes I think that first few days of school and the first few days that parents are dropping off their children or when students come into the class should be spent trying to get to know, you know? And also teachers and the students getting to know the teacher. The teacher should be, should be talking about what he or she what her preference or his preferences might be, her or his background. It's not simply to know about them because they're other, but to know, to share. And the more teachers share that, then it might be to their advantage. And sharing with parents is an equally powerful way of, of building relationships. Well, you might have already answered the next question, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Um, how can we create healthy communities? So that could take a couple hours to answer, but we'll get you to do it in a couple of minutes. And how do we become good role models for our neighbor's kids? So it's really a question about community and what n good neighbors can do to support each other. I, again, the healthy communities will depend on so many things. Mm -hmm. For those healthy communities, but you also talked about role models as well. Uh, if we think that somebody is going to be a role model because they have particular moral standards, uh, or because they are of the same ethnic or racial backgrounds, or because they are we want a male coming to school because these kids don't have any experiences with male with males in their homes. If those are going to be the narrow way in which we're going to understand role models and be good teachers and be good neighbors, then we might fail in doing so. Again, there might be approaches, but we have to interrogate them to see will they work? Are they the best for this child or for this parent or for us to build a partnership with the, with the parents? I'm not, if we do that interrogation, and we might find that it doesn't work. And it's okay for it not to work. So when it, with, and not to hold on to it because we have been doing it all these years, or it's, somebody has said they tried it in their school or in their community, then it must work in ours, no. So I, I think working through building those solid relationships, and I said solid, interestingly, I'm not sure how solid that might be, but it's important to build those kinds of significant relationships. I'm not sure I answered your question, but you can ask it. It was a big question. So I think there'd be lots to say about building healthy communities. I think, I mean, back to our earlier conversation, um, living in a capitalist system with inequality on the rise, we've seen health of communities um, not disintegrate, but certainly decline. And those are, I feel like so much of our work is to, is, is maybe we can't change some of those things, but we can certainly be aware 
of what's happening and, and the impact on the, the children, the families, I think the other thing that's a challenge for teachers, well, many times they don't live in the community. So it is it is more effort. It is a big job to get to know those other, the, the communities and the relate and, and the people are in those communities. Go ahead. So my question would be, what role do teachers uh, have, or all of us as teachers yeah. have, in ensuring that we have a good economy so that parents are working, so that have good uh, good things happening in you know classes. So it seems as if we as teachers should and principal and school boards have a responsibility to also make sure that we have a healthy economy that we that we can uh, avoid uh, having some of the poverty situation that that we we see around us because the more that's that's dealt with the better will be the situation in the classroom. So all these are interrelated. All these are interrelated. So it's not just simply working in the classroom, really, with teachers, with students and parents. It's also paying attention to what political work we have to do yeah. in the larger society, in larger Canada, to be able to make our lives in the classroom with the students better. Obviously, mm -hmm. there is work to be done there. Well, and it, it, speaking from a perspective of someone who does a lot of grassroots organizing and activism, there's such value in having educators and nurses and doctors and those who can speak in broad terms, not just to what they know is happening, but how it's impacting the very students and clients that they see. So when uh, the Nurses Association of Ontario um, backed the increase to social assistance, which has never been higher than 40% below the poverty line uh, since 95, um, and said that this is costing us money, this is costing us, um, this is costing us the health and, and well-being of, our, of many of the people that live in our, in our neighborhoods who tend our schools. There was a certain amount of traction that that got, um, as well as a doctor at St. Mike's Hospital, whose name I can't recall right now, who has actually started to prescribe a higher income as a treatment for people who are suffering from illnesses and symptoms that are related to poverty. Um, Dr. Gary Block, thank you, Katie, because you and I both know that, um, but you remembered. Um, so those kinds of statements by people who are talking about something uh, not only directly related to their sector, but that are telling the truth, right? Calling out what they're seeing and understanding the impacts um, from their perspective, I think is very, very critical. And understanding that their work or their lives are also totally interconnected to yeah. other people's lives, or to understand the medical, uh, the health, the health of our society medically, or uh, is totally related to everybody else. And the more we can pay attention to the interrelationship that exists, the more that we can say education exists in relation to the economy in, in relation to employment, in relation to all these kinds of things. The more we can pay attention to all these kinds of things and play a role in, in ensuring these other things happen to yeah. our benefit, then, then we are on our way to building a more healthy society. Well, and I think we're at a time right now where there's no lack of opportunities to do that, to get involved, to have a voice. Um, to see teachers out on the line fighting for fair workers legislation, for increases to minimum wage, to see parents supporting teachers in the fight for public education and everyone working together to fight against hate and racism and everything else. I mean, those are the kinds of, I mean, this is lifelong work, right? This is work that doesn't stop, as you said, at the classroom walls, it doesn't stop at the, at the school board or uh, um, boundary, it's it's really work that we have to be engaged in more and more. If we're working in human services, everything is interconnected. Uh, sure. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's why I want to just introduce and um, say that our next seminar, our next mon uh, webinar is going to be in June with, um, with Dr. Uh, Chris Arthur, uh, who works at TDSB, and his work has been on economic versus financial literacy. So for many years, he has studied um, the importance of, of students and others understanding the way the economy works, the way it uh, actually works it, uh, to keep some people doing very well and other people uh, losing ground on a regular basis. 
and 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 so the proponents of economic literacy are taking a very strong stand in saying that while we watch financial literacy take hold in our schools, um, no one's saying there's anything wrong with students and and people in general learning how to budget and invest, even though investing is is not necessarily something that everyone has the ability to do. It means you got a little extra money, and lots of us don't. Or lots of folks don't. So the idea, again, along with the whole theme of neoliberal agenda and trends, financial literacy uh, does teach how individuals can take hold of hopefully their financial reality um, in the absence of really talking about economic systems and how they work and how some are well placed to do well by that economic system and some just certainly aren't. So uh, I'm really looking forward to Chris Arthur. He's producing the monograph for us right now and it'll be ready uh, for the next webinar on June 10th, um, where we'll investigate that and talk about the real value of embedding um, learning in our schools around economic literacy back to your system. Your point, Carl, how do we understand the impacts if we don't understand the very system that is at play here that's so, um, so pervasive throughout our education sector and our world in general? Um, so that's, that's what he will be speaking about and how we might be able to embed more of that in our teaching in schools. Um, and help teachers be able to take hold of that information, which I think is sometimes avoided because it seems too large, too complex, too controversial, too political. And the, the idea of controversial and political, yes, because financial literacy is, uh, you, you, sometimes can be very much embedded in the neoliberalism idea, the whole idea of marketing, the whole idea of of merit, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and work hard work, and you'll be successful. Uh, you know, be be applying yourself, then you'll be successful. We have to we have to also see how those things, hard work, is also in relation to the kinds of system we live. The applying yourself is in relation to, and sometimes if the economic system. Uh, it's not facilitating those kinds of uh, situation. Then, you know, you might not. So, to me, financial literacy would also mean, and getting to know would also mean the system in which we live and how are we all caught in that process. Mm -hmm, exactly. So I hope you'll join us for that webinar on June 10th, and more information will come out shortly. Uh, any final thoughts or words, Carl? I really enjoyed having this opportunity to do it this way with you and to have uh, not just share a lot of what we have learned through the research, but also um, experiences and also uh, just having that conversation. I, I want to go back to the point about uh, how parents and students are engaged with education. They either engage with education because they feel, uh, they feel it is going to be that which the child will be will succeed, become effective participants in society, become the, the and school is the place that they're going to send their children off to, and the and the children will get the education to be able to support themselves, if not them. And sometimes parents will say, especially immigrant parents, will remind their children that I came here because of and therefore that expectation of school. And so all parents, I think all parents will approach school with, with the idea of school enabling the children for success. We as teachers have a uh, play a role in enabling that success for the parents, that which the parents wish, or we can push them into a situation where that dream, that aspiration of the parents might not necessarily be realized. And so we have to uh, pay attention to that and probably, not probably, but for sure, have conversation with parents, have conversation with students, have conversation with community members, challenge our ideas and be uncomfortable and be comfortable with uncomfortability at times in order to be able to learn because, and we would expect teachers are willing to learn because they're teachers after all. So, so I think in going forward, these will be some of the, the good things that we can do in order to ensure the kinds of society we want for our children. Awesome. Well, I think you probably just nailed it in terms of a summary statement, so I'm not going to add to that. 
Uh, thank you once again, uh, Carl, for participating. Uh, thank you to Katie for helping to run this uh, as smoothly as she does. And I just want to say thanks to all of you who attended today. Uh, the live uh, webinar is has been recorded and will be available for you as long as you've registered. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day and we'll be in touch in June. Thanks, Carl. Thank